Margaret Wallace, and myself, and the rector, who acts as a non-voting member. Members on the committee serve a three-year term. The committee builds a list of nominees from a variety of sources, including church commission members, parish volunteers, and suggestions from the vestry and clergy. Our work takes into consideration the leadership needs of the vestry, the goals of the parish, and the experience and expertise of potential nominees. This year, we will elect two new vestry members who will serve a three-year term. We nominate Ginger Goodrich to serve as the liaison to the Stewardship Commission and Volunteer Ministries, and we nominate Rick Ward to serve as the liaison to the Membership Commission. In addition, current vestry member Jim Pasquarello will assume the role of Senior Warden, Anna Marie Hellebush will assume the role of Junior Warden, and Chris Russell will assume the role of Property Warden. Our nominees for Youth Vestry Representative are Maddie Jamison and Trey DuBose, each of whom will serve a one-year term as non-voting members. Lastly, we nominate Elizabeth Bitterman to serve a three-year term as the Deanery and Diocesan Representative. Elizabeth will join Susan Hunsaker, who will serve for two additional years, and Beverly Ford, who will serve for one additional year. A special thanks to Frank Sarah, who has just completed his third year of service as a Deanery Representative. Congratulations to all of our nominees. This concludes the report of the nominating committee. Steve, thank you very much. And I want to offer a word of thanks to Steve, who's chaired this commission for a number of years. I'm not sure there's a role at St. Thomas Church that Steve has not held. Um, he has done just about everything here and has served in so many beautiful ways. And wherever he does it, he does it with extraordinary grace and diligence and follow through. So, Steve, on behalf of the entire congregation, thank you. Thank you for your leadership. And all of you. We have a, uh, a second to for the motion for the candidates before we vote. Second. All in favor of the Aye. candidates for election to the vestry? Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you all very, very much. We're looking forward to our new group of vestry. And I'd like to at this time invite Jim Pasquarello to come forward with words of thanksgiving about those who are finishing their term on vestry today. Thanks, Good morning. Our parish has been blessed with the service of three outstanding leaders who have concluded their vestry terms and therefore earned their freedom. <laughs> uh, today we thank Stephen Morris, Bill Potts, and David Thayer. Uh, I invited, in anticipation today, our vestry members to share uh, with me uh, what we appreciate most collectively about our outgoing vestry. And based on the frequency of the word used, the thoughtful to describe Steve Morris, he is clearly one of our most thoughtful leaders in St. Thomas. Steve listens carefully. He offers thoughtful insights that always add value to the conversation. He's an educator who leads the middle school at Episcopal Academy. He's a teacher first and foremost with a remarkable love for children. And he's a fantastic father and husband. Fortunately for my kids, I've attended the dad's class that he taught here. And no offense to our other teachers who participated in that class. Apparently, you were pretty good, too. <laughs> Steve <laughs> kind of stole the show. <laughs> Steve also chaired the search committee that identified Sherry Petrakis to lead our preschool. And he therefore deserves much credit for our school and its flourishing future. Thank you, Steve. Bill Potts embodies the virtue of selfless service. Bill has more than a few fans. Listen to these testimonials from fellow vestry members. Bill considers all sides when making decisions. Bill goes out of his way to carry things, serve people, and assist in any way possible. He's, also, he's always willing to put in the extra time and stay late to make sure the job gets done. In other remarks, Bill truly lives into his baptismal covenant. Marek adds, Bill will and has done just about everything possible for St. Thomas's Church. He exemplifies the best of our congregation. He 
He's extremely hardworking and thoughtful. He sees something that needs doing and he does it. No job is too big or too small to capture Bill's attention. He serves without seeking recognition, but he's the first to highlight what others have done and encourage that they be recognized and thanked. He never says an unkind word about anyone. He is so faithful about worship that only pneumonia, or a flood, or three feet of snow <laughs> could keep Bill from attending church. So it sounds like Marek has set a target on Bill as the incumbent champion in our next worship challenge. <laughs> I've heard it said that some Christians also think that Bill is a member of our staff. <laughs> We should tell them that there's no way we can afford his overtime. <laughs> absolute pleasure to work with David. I'm thankful for his steady and prayerful guidance. Each time I've sent him an email or asked him a question, he always responds, having given much thought and consideration to my comments. His quiet and compassionate nature sets the tone for an effective leadership style. Another shares, he's really good at making people feel special. And here's some more descriptions of David that will help make him blush. <laughs> Warm and friendly smile. Active listener, optimistic, always remembers to say thank you. Yeah. <laughs> probably grew up eating all his vegetables too. <laughs> Marek shares of his word, David lives each lives his faith each day. He is humble and extremely dependable, a steady hand, a voice of reason, balanced and thoughtful, and always has a kind word. He is wise beyond his years constantly strives to see the best in each person. <laughs> For my own part, I can't let today go by without recognizing that David's also kind of our fashion icon on campus. <laughs> <laughs> he quite literally taught me what the sartorial standard is. <laughs> Before I conclude, and I assure you I'm getting close, uh, there's also an uncomfortable possibility that we need to confront together here today. Um, David might be a little crazy. <laughs> Presiding Bishop Michael Curry, in a sermon with, uh, that goes by the same title of his book, Crazy Christians, he says, we need some Christians who are as crazy as the Lord, crazy enough to love like Jesus, to give like Jesus, to forgive like Jesus, to do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God like Jesus. Crazy enough to dare to change the world from the nightmare it is often into something close to the dream that God, the, close to the dream that God dreams for it. And for those who would follow him, those who would be his disciples, those who would live and be the, the people the way, it might come as a shock, but they are called to craziness. And I hope David won't, share, won't mind that I share this story. But as our vestry explored the topic of homelessness, Discussion arose of panhandling, and David reminded us that while some of our homeless brothers and sisters seek money, all wish to be seen, heard, and understood. They wish to matter as people, to all of us as they matter to the Lord. This wasn't just talk or something that David read about and was reciting. Rather, he spoke from his own experience one day while visiting Center City on Business. And as he stopped and heard one man's story, he took 20, 15, 20 minutes with talking with his new friend. Uh, I'm, I'm asking, who among us does that? I mean, it's wonderful, right? But who actually does it? It's a little, it's a little different. Maybe a little crazy. <laughs> it's uncomfortable for most, assuredly. And certainly uncommon. Well, why do I share this story? Well, David is... One of the many among us today who help us to be better Christians through their example of their actions. Many of us don't automatically think to act in the way that David did that day in Center City. It just doesn't occur to us automatically. And the ways, it doesn't occur to us automatically the ways that we can serve faithfully. 
But the lesson for me in hearing our brother David story uh, that day is that this inspiration does happen for someone like David, someone who's in the habit of growing each day in his faith and understanding and love for God, and then commits to live into his faith each day. And I bet that if we asked David about the compassion and attention he gave to his new friend that day, he would instead describe it as a gift that he received. We should all be as crazy as David. Of course, we don't all live with perfect intention every day, but when we focus on what makes us Christian, we might start doing something that's a little different in a crazily awesome way that blesses our world. As our new vestry assembles, we will greatly miss the presence of Steve, Bill, and David and their kindness of thought, word, and deed. Gentlemen, thank you for your service. And with that, we promise to give you three weeks before calling on your talents again. <laughs> Except for Bill, there's too much work to do in the spring time. Well, thank you for that wonderful, wonderful words about three great, great leaders. I wonder if we could call David, Stephen, Bill up just for a moment. We have a gift for each of you, and we'd like to take a picture of you and uh, say thank you. So on that note, I'd like to invite Will Gillespie, Natalie Bowder, and Margaret Wallace to come forward and offer a short testimonial about something significant that's taken place in their life through ministry here at St. Thomas this past year. Will Gillespie. Thanks for letting me come here. Um, so I do, a, I participate in a couple of ministries that tend to fly under the radar in a way. Uh, one of them is singing in the choir, um, which, yeah, we're kind of up in front and you can see us and you can hear us, uh, but we don't always get to intermingle. Um, so I really love that Michael has been exploring a little further using the unique instrument of the choir in some of the ways that you couldn't do with an organ or a piano or a band or whatever. Um, you know, that we've even during Lent got to enfold the congregation and support the congregation from right in your midst. Um, that's been really fun for me to help feel more connected with the rest of you. Um, I don't always know everybody's names because I don't get to sit down with you. So that was really a special experience. I also love being able to wrestle with a piece of an offering that... Um, is connected to the liturgy in some way. Um, maybe more than most of you get to, I feel like the music tends to like wash over and you kind of miss <laughs> it in the flurry of taking communion or um, you know, giving your offering to the offering plate. And there's some really rich stuff there. But because I have to wrestle with it from week to week on Thursday nights, um, sometimes part of it will come back to haunt me as I'm going through the rest of my life. Um, and it's really kind of cool. Um, I kind of wish I had a group of friends who would like to get together for lunch after the Sunday service and just unpack the richness that is in the liturgy. Um, not just in the hymns that we sing and the music, but sometimes the prayers of the people just hits me and uh, resonates with something in my heart. Um, so that's kind of a little piece of what it's like to be a choir member. Um, we have, Michael is unpacking theology for us 
little bits at a time. We lost uh, a very dear member of the staff singers um, this year. And so Michael created a safe space for us to get together and talk um, and tell stories about her. And then he talked about the, there's a part in the service where we actually get to join our voices with the angels and archangels and all of the company of heaven. Um, including Jessica, as we sing this hymn to forever, you know, glorify God, as we say, holy, holy, holy. And having that kind of leadership to be able to understand another piece of the liturgy in that way was really rich for me. Another ministry I'm involved in is um, the knitting ministry, the prayer shawl and needlepoint ministry, um, which really kind of flows flies under the radar most of the time. It reminds me of a point where Jesus talked about going into your closet and praying in secret, uh, which is often how knitting prayer shawls happens. Um, Jeff and I, Jeff, my partner, and I both come from a, maybe a, a perspective of social knitting. And so I've really enjoyed uh, knitting, and I'm going to refer to my notes a little here. Um, it's a chance... Knitting tends to create a unique, or crafting really, creates a safe space for people to get together and just be together. And I think something really wonderful can happen when the body of Christ comes together um, without too much of an agenda. You have the opportunity to inquire and to speak into where is God in each other's lives. Um, so even in the mundane things of life, it's just a chance to be. Um, it's a different energy than a cocktail hour, which is not my strong suit. Um, but knitters, you know, somebody once said that knitting tends to attract people with low self-esteem. Um, you know, maybe that's me. But it's lovely because I get to be with other people who maybe need a little more space. And as we're making things with our hands, um, we're making tangible expressions of love and um, the message you're not alone and the, this a, a tangible prayer sometimes. Um, but we're also building community together. And because of that, I feel every time we pray um, in the prayers of the people, uh, we pray for a certain segment of people, the sick and the friendless and the needy. I feel tangibly connected to them, but I also feel more connected to people that I would have never known otherwise. So I'm grateful for that opportunity. Thanks. Hello, uh, my name is Natalie Bowder, and I'm a part of the Corster program here at St. Thomas. Uh, I absolutely love being a chorister. It has helped me meet new people who are just as interested in singing as I am. Um, I know I don't have to tell you this, but Michael is an amazing director and always does such a wonderful job with teaching us new music and techniques and making everyone feel welcome even if they've joined halfway through the year. I, uh, I joined the chorister program when, about when Michael became the head of the music program. Uh, since then I feel I've learned a lot and my singing voice is improved uh, because of the techniques he has taught us. Uh, he pushes us to try harder and do better each and every week. Uh, it's so wonderful to be a part of the course program, and I am very excited to someday join the adult choir. Thank you. headed to Cuba on a pilgrimage entitled A Bridge Between Cultures, arranged and led by Merrick. In 2012, my husband Bob led a trip to Cuba under the auspices of the Audubon, and I had no interest. At that time, I had no interest. Uh, but when Merrick sent out the invitation to uh, join him on a pilgrimage, I was one of the first to sign up. As many of you know, Merrick has worked closely with the Right Reverend Griselda Delgado de Carpio, the Bishop of the Episcopal Church of Cuba, and other clergy and laypersons that he has met on previous trips to the year before. 
taking when Americans have been involved in Cuba in helping rebuild churches which have fallen into ruins. The future of the Episcopal Church in Cuba will be a major agenda item at the diocesan convention this summer. One of the questions we frequently addressed was where did we see God in Cuba? My first response would be everywhere, starting with the people. Despite the hardships created by the Castro regime and the extreme poverty, the people have smiles on their faces and make every effort to please. And as a result, the hotels and restaurants exceeded our expectations. The warm weather and the blue skies helped. During our week's stay, we had several opportunities to experience the work of the Episcopal Church firsthand and to see the role of God. On our second evening, we met with the bishop and had a short lit litany of the Cross of Nails at her cathedral, with a group from around the world representing the Cross of Nails. And that was followed by a wonderful interactive dinner at a local open-air restaurant. For those of you who are not familiar with this organization, it was inspired by the Coventry story of destruction, rebuilding, and renewal after World War II. On our third day, we traveled to Matanzas to visit the Theological Seminary, where the Episcopal clergy are trained alongside other denominations. Thanks to Merrick's Spanish, an interpretation by our local guide, we were able to learn about the work being done there as well as enjoy the beautiful site. The next morning, we went to Lemonar to visit the ruins of the Episcopal Church, which was destroyed by a hurricane. We met with a small group of women and two men who worship in what remains of the church, a former vestibule where clergy rode. Merrick has raised a substantial amount of money towards rebuilding the church, and they are most grateful. They had a model that they showed us that they were so excited and they said to rebuild the church would be 465,000, I think that's right here. 148,000. 148, well, I mean, to us, to be honest, that just doesn't seem like a large sum of money, but to them it just seems overwhelming. So they're most appreciative of anything that we can do for them. And St. Fuegos, we were invited to join with a group from the local Episcopal Church and see firsthand the water for purification system they had installed thanks to funding from the United States. Merrick and the minister interacted and a group, including an amazing 93-year-old woman, sang for us and the minister's son played the harmonica. Although none of us other than Merrick spoke Spanish, we were able to share a meaningful fellowship. In addition to our religious experiences, we were able to enjoy the architectural and cultural sites in Havana, Trinidad, and San Fuegos. Highlights included the Museum of the Revolution and the National Museum of the Fine Arts, the Cologne Cemetery, Old Havana, and Ernest Hemingway's house, as well as the beautiful cities of San Fuegos and Trinidad. Our final religious experience took place at the Park Central Hotel on a Sunday morning. Instead of returning to the cathedral, Merrick found a quiet place in the hotel and conducted a communion service for the group. Instead of a sermon, he asked each of us the question, where did you see God in Cuba? I think we all realized that we had not only seen God at work in Cuba, but also in each other and as a group. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Natalie. And thank you, Margaret, for those moving words about ministries you've been part of and the ways in which you've experienced God in your life through this special, special community. For those of you who might have an interest, we will be returning to Cuba this coming year. So if you have an interest, please let me know. We're hoping to establish a Cuba committee for the diocese to help other churches become engaged and support the Episcopal Church in Cuba. This time it's my privilege to invite Jim Pastorell to come forward for the presentation of the ninth annual St. Thomas Awards. Each year we recognize individuals for their extraordinary commitment to the life of St. Thomas's family and to the end of our broader ministries. The following individuals thus been selected to receive this year's St. Thomas's Awards. Our first recipient of the St. Thomas's Award has been a dedicated member of our community for a great many years. 
serving faithfully on the altar guild, participating in many a country fair, selflessly labeling and mailing the parish call for years on end, loyally stitching the quilts, and we are told, serving as a member of the Order of the Daughters of the King, which has as its mission reflecting God's love throughout the world. Certainly this dedicated disciple of Christ is the very embodiment of that mission, reflecting as she does God's love through steadfast prayer, selfless service, and quiet evangelism. It is an honor then to present this award to Dot Hager. Thank you. 
Thomas as a word has been deeply involved in many areas of church ministry for any number of years, during which time she has prepared for this one. She's served as a Sunday school teacher, organized, cooked for, and delivered meals to eat for friends, volunteered at the Fall Harvest Fest, served in prison ministry, helped organize, collect, and sort gifts for the Be an Angel Christmas Party, served as a parish visitor, volunteered at the Church of the Advocates after school program in North Philadelphia, chaired the country fair, helped organize, collect, purchase, and distribute Easter outfits for children at the ECS's St. Barnabas Mission, launched the ECS scholarship program, served as a devoted volunteer at the Second Saturday Sales, and as a liaison to the Fernley Fund, and as a longtime member of the Outreach Commission. Manned a cooking and serving team for the Church of the Advocates Soup Kitchen. Volunteered devotedly for the Hospitality Commission. Launched, directed, and volunteered at the Outreach Summer Camp for Inner City Kids. Served on Vestry. And organized the Needlepoint Kneeler Project. Personally needlepointing about a dozen or more kneelers herself. So, what have you all done recently? <laughs> that we present this award to Pam Sarah. famous pub where he is uh, <laughs> following my orders to drink a pint in my honor every day. So uh, we miss them both and look forward to hearing them back soon. At this point, it's my privilege to uh, turn it over to Nat Taylor, our accounting warden, and I just want to say a word before Nat speaks. Nat has served tirelessly and worked incredibly hard, focused greatly on detail, but also looking at the bigger picture. He's really focused on making sure we have the highest level of transparency and do the best job of communicating about our finances possible. He works quietly behind the scenes all the time. So please join me in welcoming Nat Taylor and the finance <laughs> Church 
expenses were lower than expected in 2017 due to personnel and utility costs. Utilities are 8% of total expenses and creeping higher. So we are looking into ways to manage those costs, including an energy audit, a solar field, and conversion from oil heat to gas. With 45 acres and nine buildings, campus maintenance will always be a challenge. Fortunately, there are dedicated people working to improve our facilities. With ongoing efforts at the barn, the schoolhouse, the entrances, the roving room, and a very successful Broughton House renovation. The cemetery had a nice $20,000 gain on 26% higher revenue, including $80,000 of endowment income and well-managed expenses. The school also had a small gain on 8% of higher revenue. Sherry, Dana, and their team have worked long hours to fill all eight classrooms. If that was not enough, the preschool endowment has increased to $140,000 since its launch in 2014. And the 75 plus families of St. Thomas are raising $40,000 for an amazing new playground. As the capital campaign, as for the capital campaign, your generous contributions allow for $500,000 in remaining projects, and the bridge loan has been paid down to $140,000. Unfortunately, our contractor, Reeves Construction, filed for bankruptcy in early 2017. George Ryder, fortunately, and his legal team have since settled $100,000 worth of property liens and are working hard to resolve any outstanding claims. Looking forward to 2018, music programming is taking the lead, thanks to $50,000 in dedicated pledges with youth programming right behind. Total church contributions of $1.15 million are slightly below 2017 and other revenue sources are projected to climb. Overall expense growth is limited to 3% and compensation increases are minimal. Preschool revenue should increase to by 20% to over $500,000 and the combined preschool and cemetery transfers to the church should total over $100,000. All are record highs. In summary, the church would like to see, as always, higher membership and higher pledges. But recently, income sources have been diversified, thanks to your generosity and investments in our facilities and staff. All the financials are included in your annual report. We try to be transparent, and if all goes well, quarterly updates will be followed by Q&A sessions. If you have any questions, please reach out to myself or Steve Elliott in the back. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for taking something with a lot of complexity and making it something that we can all understand. And that wanted me to alert you that we have not only the annual report that all of you have before you, but the larger copy with uh, ample financial reporting in it. And if you have insomnia, I encourage you to make sure you do take a copy. But do take one home. Feel free to read through that and speak to Nat about any questions you have or Steve Elliott, who is accepted the reins now as the chair of the Finance Commission who is doing an outstanding job of succeeding Ron Hamilton in that position. I have been asked by the Adult Spiritual Formation Commission to let you know also on your tables are copies of the six by three by one sessions. It helps us enormously if you can sign up in advance. 
You don't have to, but it helps us greatly. So if you please could read through that and let Judy Neely know which one you'll be attending. That would be great. Let her know during this coming week. This time we'd like to invite Bill Lutz to come forward and offer a brief report about our endowment. Bill Lutz. Thank you, Mary. Uh, another financial report. I'll try to keep it lively. Um, the, the endowment has done well over the last couple of years, uh, but I'll, I'm going to give you a little history of how we do operate, because um, I know some people aren't sure what we do. We do meet quarterly, and we meet after the end of each calendar quarter to review the performance of the uh, endowment. And in the past year, we've had our um, investment manager, the endowment today is managed uh, professionally by uh, PNC, but Matt McKenzie joins the committee and he goes over the performance uh, and he also presents the market outlook, the PNC market outlook, which is quite detailed. And we do um, quiz them and we ask them a lot of questions. And the committee, we really evaluate the overall performance and we look at it against the benchmarks which are appropriate to each part of the endowment and our expectations. Um, I think the current members of the endowment committee are in your annual report. Now, in 2017, the endowment ended the year at 6,718,000, which is up 658,000, or 10.9%, during 2017. Um, th this increase really is uh, represented primarily by the performance of the endowment, but by some new money that did go in. The in investment strategy in the endowment committee is to grow the endowment. We would love new money coming in, but on the current endowment, we look at the um, annual payout to the church plus inflation plus fees plus a little growth to be less than the overall market performance over a market cycle. Recently we have been able to do that. The first decade of the 21st century, as you know, investments didn't perform well, fairly, well at all, but they have been performing much better. In 2017 and 2018, the payout rate is 4% based on the three-year average, um, trailing three-year average, um, and based on 12, 30, December 31 values. Now, the performance, or the growth in the endowment for 2017 was up 14.7%. Now, you notice that's a little higher than I said the actual dollar amount, but it actually comes out to the four, approximately the 4% difference, which is the payout. Um, and um, I believe in the detailed uh, report of the endowment committee, uh, it does show the performance uh, for the past year broken down by the total endowment, by equities, and by bonds. And it does also show the benchmarks which we compare against. And you'll notice for last year we did very well against the benchmark. We were really almost right there, just a hair above it, or a hair below. Uh, I'd like to point out, for the last three years, in 2016, the endowment contributed to the church, which is basically two different um, budgets. It's the church and the cemetery. But they contributed in 16, 208,000, in 17, 213,000, and in 18, 219,000, which is a growth of about 2.7% which we're very pleased with. Um, and it actually contributes something around, on the overall basis, about 13% of the budget. Now, if you have any questions, um, I'd be glad to answer them. If not, thank you. And, um, you know, the church would really like to grow the endowment. And I'd like to just point out that we are trying to do our best in the endowment committee, but I have to say the vestry, the clergy, and the endowment committee to oversee and have the investments managed well and also the new money coming in and the
the withdrawals manage well. So it can actually stay up with um, the keep the same purchasing power over time. Thank you. Well, thank you for your outstanding leadership. Um, a little thing that a lot of people do not know is that Bill helped to uh, save about $100,000 for the endowment. He can tell you the details about that sometime, but his personal great attentiveness to how it's managed and the financial numbers saved our church a great deal of money. And so we thank you, Bill, for your long-time stewardship and serving on that. I wish to thank everyone who's a member of the 1698 Society, and for all those who have gone on to their greater reward and left a request to our church. <clears throat> when I was first called to serve here as rector, church, the Episcopal Church's top consultant said, a church like yours needs to have a $25 million endowment. And I was in a corridor with a bunch of other clergy around me, and I just kind of shrunk down to about the size of the shoes. Our endowment at that time was $2.5 million one-tenth of what he said we needed to operate a church this size. So it is something that we need to grow. We do a beautiful job managing it. But everyone who leaves the gifts here leaves the gifts to something that is precious to all of us. And it, I think, is much more needed here than at any university. So please keep that in mind. As you think about planting trees whose shade you'll never have a chance to lie under but others will benefit greatly from. This time I'd like to invite Sherry Petrakis to come forward and share with us about our preschool. And Sherry's done an exceptional job leading it. We're so grateful to have you this morning. We we'll look forward to hearing your report. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I won't take too much of your time because you've heard what Jim had to say about Dana and how the preschool is doing, and of course, like Matt said. Um, I want to thank the vestry and the strategic planning committee and Merrick for all the support they've given the preschool this year. Um, this current year, we're, we have 113 students and six classrooms, plus our STEAM classroom, which is not a STEAM room. Like, you're not getting STEAM. <laughs> Science, technology, engineering, art, and math, and yes, you can do it even with two-year-olds. We are the only preschool in the area that has that for children that young. And Amy Roke is our fabulous STEAM teacher, which I think many of you would know here. Um, next, we have six classrooms for this year. We have registered uh, in four weeks of registration. We filled the entire school, which is a record time of filling it. Um, the report says that we are thinking about opening another classroom, but we are definitely opening another one. Um, Two-year-olds, we, we can't have too many two-year-olds. It's just we have to have more. So um, we have nine, actually, uh, on Friday I registered two more. So we have nine in that classroom. We should be full by uh, the end of this year. Nat's happy to hear that. Uh, so that will make seven classrooms plus our steam room and 125 children is what we're working towards. Um, we've had a wonderful year with our board, obviously led by Dana. Um, we are continuing to make that board um, increase it and make it even more professional with some board members, new ones coming in. A lot of people don't know that we have a board. Uh, many parents didn't know that for years, but um, we really have a strong board that works really hard to make these decisions and are very thoughtful in what they do. Um, we have a summer camp that we're starting. We just started registration for that. We could usually have about 50 to 80 children a day in our summer camp, and that goes through the end of July. So we're looking for that to still be a success for our kids. And we, I will be teaching for the second year a STEAM camp for kindergarten through second graders. So we are now bringing children back that were graduates of St. Thomas Nursery School to come back onto our property, which is a great way to get them experiencing St. Thomas again. So um, other than that, we are strong and doing really well. I appreciate you letting me give you a report. And any questions you have for me, I'll be here. Thank you. We're in the home stretch. Yes. Elizabeth Taylor told each of her seven husbands, if you're not 
That won't keep you long. <laughs> She was an Episcopalian, but I do know for a fact that her so marriage was officiated at by a, an Episcopal priest. No surprise. I stand before you, uh, many years ago I stood before you with a huge mound of papers to cover and go through. And uh, fortunately I'm older and wiser and realize that a few well-chosen words go a lot further. Evelyn Underhill wrote a famous book, the definitive book on Christian mysticism. She was the first woman ever to lead a clergy retreat for the Church of England, and she was the first woman ever to teach a course at Oxford University. She was a hero of mine. In a letter in 1930 to the Archbishop of Canterbury, Cosmo Lang, she wrote, God is the interesting thing about religion. God is the interesting thing about religion. So I just want to focus briefly with you about God and all of us on this holy hillside. <clears throat> because for over 300 years, this is a place where people have come to focus on God in their lives and in their community, in their nation, and in the world. Abraham Joshua Heschel was a refugee of the Nazis. He was a confidant and close friend who marched with Martin Luther King Jr. And he was the most important Jewish theologian of his time. Toward the end of his life, he said, I did not ask for success. I asked for wonder. Wonder. So, Liz Costello and I must have been thinking along the same lines because in your sermon you must have mentioned wonder a dozen times today. <laughs> wonder is a gift that's not spoken about a lot, but it is the ultimate gift that helps us to experience God. And it's what makes the lives of children and their spiritual lives so magical because they appreciate wonder and help us to do the same, as Sherry and Dana and the whole preschool know so well. So let us take a moment to wonder. St. Thomas is 319 years old. It is one of the 25 oldest continuously operating churches in the United States. Our church was 34 years old when George Washington was born. We've been serving Jesus and doing God's work for a long time. There are a few institutions in the United States that are this old, that are still growing, that are still located in the same place, and that are accomplishing so much. We have much to be proud of. And we might just wonder, how did it all happen? How did this church have such staying power? wonder what the next 319 years might bring. We began with one acre of land from a gift from John Sheaf as part of a major land grant from William Penn. We now possess 45 acres, nine separate buildings. We try to be the best stewards we possibly can of to use fully for ministry as much as possible and to share with the wider community. I wonder what it will all look like 100 years from now. Our campus exudes history. Medal of Honor winners and revolutionary soldiers lie buried here. This is a sacred place. And all of us have experienced that at one time or another. This is a place where all generations gather together. And there are very few institutions left in our country that are for all generations. Our parish makes a local, national, and even international impact. The Honduras Water Ministry, Our Little Roses, Las Pequeñas Rosas, working with the Episcopal Church in Cuba, the ECS Mentoring Program, Mission Possible, 
the second Saturday of sales, the Harvest Festival, the Be an Angel Christmas Party, the Bible Challenge. We touch lives locally, nationally, and internationally. There are just a handful of American churches that are this old and still growing and impacting in so many ways. I wonder what our impact will look like 50 years from now. Last year, 70 people joined our parish. Our membership increased over 1,400. Our average Sunday in attendance increased by 15 people over the previous year. We baptized more people than we buried. We were once an older church with very few young families. We are now a church with many young families. Our family table service doubled in the past 12 months. I wonder what it will all look like five years from now. Our course of program is growing by leaps and bounds, thank you to Michael Smith. I wonder what our choirs will look like a few years from now. The Reverend Liz Costello carefully crafts our liturgy and ensures that our worship at St. Thomas is always traditional and reverent but never boring and always engaging and able to lift our spirits to God. She's a great clergy colleague. Thank you, Liz, for all that you do. And starting next December, the Reverend Tim Steves will be free to return to St. Thomas Church on Sundays. If we increase our pledging, Tim can join us every Sunday to help lead worship. <laughs> Children's and Youth Ministries hosted 150 youth and children and adults in this room for a great celebration to raise about $7,500 for the Mission Possible trip this year. We have twice as many youth signed up to go this year as we did last year. She is doing a great, great job. I wonder what our youth and children's ministries will look like five years from now. People have described our director of parish life, Emily Gibbon, as a home run. <laughs> She's a true star, and she does so much in so many ways for our ministries, and is a great, great colleague. We have momentum. We are growing. Good things are happening. God is good to us all the time. <clears throat> our preschool is growing and firing on all eight cylinders. If a preschool can fire on all eight cylinders. <laughs> Sherry Petrakis is doing an outstanding job of leading it, along with board chair Dana Tedman, a great board, a superb crew of teachers, and a wonderful chaplain named Liz Costello. This fall, we will set our highest school enrollment ever, thanks to our new classrooms and our great leadership. I wonder what these young students will be doing in their lives, 30, 40, and 50 years from now. I wonder how the great start on life they got at our preschool will shape the rest of their life. I echo Jim Pasquarella's words about David Thayer and Steve Morris and Bill Potts. They are extraordinary leaders who will be greatly missed. Leadership is everything. We are so blessed to have so many talented people who offer to serve, who use their time, their talents, their creativity, their energy to make so much happen here at St. Thomas Church. We have the best leaders in the Episcopal Church. When our staff and I are reading a book called Seven Practices of Effective Ministry, we actually believe that by doing less moving forward and focusing more on doing what we do well, we will continue to thrive as a community. And I wonder what that's going to look like. My one concern is that our church continues to grow, and that we grow in Christ, and that we grow as stewards. Each year we lose a few of our oldest members, 
and it is not unusual for us to lay to rest an individual who has been giving fifteen, twenty, or twenty-five thousand dollars a year to support our ministries at St. Thomas Church. It can take fifteen to twenty-five new individuals or families to make up for that one generous steward. And hence, I urge you all and each of us to grow in Christ, to grow in stewardship, and to make disciples for Jesus. If we continue to do this faithfully, our future will always be bright. And we won't have to worry about it or wonder about it. I thank all of you for making St. Thomas Church such an incredible, loving, faithful, serving community. You are awesome. I want to close by wondering with you what this church might look like in 319 years when at the 600th and 38th annual meeting of the church, they gather to reflect on what went well during the past year and wonder what the year ahead will bring. Because of what we're doing now, God willing, they'll still be here to wonder. Thank you. God bless you. May we all live with our eyes open and wonder at what God is doing around us and through us and within us. God bless you. And now we open up to any questions that you may have on any of the reports that have been shared this day. And may we conclude with our Closing him, followed by our closing prayer, led by Ms. Costello as Michael comes forward. Thank you, Michael, again for all your gifts and sharing with us the ministry music. In the spirit of doing less and doing it well, we're going to sing the third stanza of this hymn. <laughs> but it's not to save time. Uh, I picked this hymn because of this third stanza for this annual meeting. I don't know if you caught it, but in the lesson today, uh, the letter from 1 John, it said, It has not yet been revealed to us what we will be. And I think that's very true of St. Thomas right now. And this third stanza asks God to finish then this new creation. Sing this third stanza with me.